Every search you make, every click you take, they'll be watching you. Tired of companies like Google and Facebook watching everything you do online? There's actually a simple solution. DuckDuckGo. It's an all-in-one privacy app with a built-in private search engine, web browser, one-click data clearing, email protection, and more. All for free. Download the app today and get the most comprehensive privacy protection with a push of a button. DuckDuckGo. Privacy simplified. Hello, everyone. This is Rosie Tran, and welcome to Stupid Sexy Privacy, a Weibo.tv special report sponsored by our friends at DuckDuckGo. You may have heard my voice at the end of every episode on Weibo.tv. I'm the one asking you to leave a review. Which, by the way, I hope you've done, right? You've left us a review? Okay, great. Unless you're lying. <clears throat> well, I'm a lot more than a voice. I'm also Weibo.tv's intrepid reporter, and over the course of this miniseries, I'm going to share with you short, actionable tips you can use to protect your privacy. These tips were sourced by our fearless leader, he really hates when we call him that, BJ Mendelson. BJ, for those of you who may not know, is the author of the book Privacy and How We Get It Back, a book that was published in the before times. This means before COVID. BJ is currently writing a sequel called How to Protect Yourself from Fascists and Weirdos. So everything we're going to hear in this miniseries is the most up-to-date information he's researched, bringing us into 2023 and beyond. Throughout the series, you're also going to hear from some special guests and experts in the information security field. You hear that sound? That means it's time for today's privacy tip. I don't know how many of you remember the club, but it was the big red metal thing people would put on their steering wheels. The idea was for thieves looking for their next car to steal, they'd skip the ones using the club. That's because while not impossible to steal that car, the time, effort, and energy just wouldn't be worth it to do so. Meaning the criminal would just move on to the next unprotected car. Lucky for you. Not so lucky for the guy who parked behind you, you know? In the late 80s and early 90s, the club was all the rage among drivers looking to protect their vehicles. And although the club's presence in pop culture has faded, it's still with us today as an effective theft deterrent. Now, you might wonder what this has to do with securing your email and social media accounts in the 21st century. And the answer is this. The internet has its own version of the club. And that comes in the form of a hardware authentication device. There are a few of them out there, but the one we recommend is the YubiKey. The most basic version will set you back $25, which is less than what it will cost you to buy Top Gun Maverick, a movie that's fun to watch until you remember you saw that same movie 30 years ago when it was just called Top Gun. The Yubico key works exactly like the club. You just go into your Google account settings, turn on two-factor authentication, and then set it to security key. Then you'd plug your YubiKey into your laptop, and now your account is secure. Does this make it impossible for someone to break into your account? No. Remember, there is no 100% guaranteed way to protect yourself from fascists and weirdos on the internet. But the YubiKey gets you pretty damn close to 99%. The only downside to using a YubiKey is, let's say you travel a lot? If you leave your YubiKey at home and you sign in from a new location, you'll probably be out of luck in terms of getting into your account without it. So, it's good to purchase two of them. One that you travel with and one that you leave at home. If you're super paranoid like BJ is, you can also purchase a third one and keep it in a safe somewhere too. So, if you're the kind of person who loses things, you'll want to purchase more than one of them, just in case. Let's touch on one more thing while we're here talking about your email security. Your account security is pretty solid for those using Gmail once you start using the YubiKey. Even if someone sends you a suspicious email and you click on the link that you definitely shouldn't have, that person won't be able to access your account because of the YubiKey. And phishing, which is the practice of sending someone shady emails and texts with shadier links, is one of the most common ways fascists and weirdos try to access your stuff. That's why these YubiKeys are so important. But Google also offers an additional layer of security that we recommend if you're often the target of online harassment. It's called Advanced Threat Protection, and we've included a link to how to sign up in the show notes of today's episode. Advanced Threat Protection utilizes your YubiKey, and the program offers an extensive security scan for every file that's sent to you. In addition, this program helps to keep malware off your phone, which, if you have an Android phone, is a must-have if you can get into the program. If you think you need the extra layer of security, and for women in particular, we believe this tool is essential for your protection. You should sign up immediately. 
Next week, I'll show you a trick to securely send financial and health information to someone using a free ProtonMail account. We'll also explain why you might want to consider ProtonMail for those of you not currently using Gmail. This includes BJ's dad, who, for reasons known only to him, continues to use a Hotmail email address in the year of our Lord, 2023. Are you still listening? We hope so, because we have a special surprise. Back in 2017, BJ's first book on privacy came out. It was called Privacy and How We Get It Back. Broadway actor Roger Wayne did the narration for the audio edition of the book. Our editor, Andrew, was nice enough to go through the audiobook and pull out the sections that are still very much worth sharing with you today. So if you stick around and listen to this miniseries after every privacy tip, you'll hear another excerpt from BJ's book, Privacy and How We Get It Back. Take it away, Roger! 9. They're all in on it. It's easy to think that shopping online is something everyone does and is the wave of the future. At the moment, according to Pew, 10% of all retail purchases were made online in 2015. I have no doubt that number will tick up over time, and that 10% represents billions of dollars, $350 billion to be exact in 2015, But it's that other 90% that seems to get no love these days in the press. Which is especially weird when you consider that most people surveyed prefer to buy things offline. And when they do buy things online, they do so infrequently, or to get things no one cares about, like batteries. Take that, batteries! The media would have you believe that Amazon is straight-up murdering brick-and-mortar stores. What's more likely is that the middle class of America is dying, and so were the stores that were developed to support them. If brick and mortar was being killed for good simply because of the power of Amazon alone, Amazon wouldn't have bought Whole Foods and wouldn't be opening brick and mortar stores of its own. If we look just at comic book stores, for example, I don't have to go to them anymore because I use the Comixology app to buy my comics. So you would think that's why comic book stores are struggling. The reality is so much more complex than that. The stores are struggling because of a monopoly that exists in the comics industry in terms of distribution, i.e. diamond comic distributors, and because the store owners have to place huge orders on books that won't be out for months, regardless of whether or not those books are any good. That means the stores can, and often do, get stuck with crappy products that nobody wants, but which they had to place an order for anyway because that's how the comics industry works. Comic book fans still like going to the stores, And most who go there now pick up their weekly comics in addition to other things like graphic novels, toys, and other merchandise. Myth. Amazon is killing comic book stores. Reality. The comic book industry has a messed up distribution pipeline that results in all sorts of chaos and lost revenue that puts many stores at risk of closing. Amazon is a factor, but not the factor. By the way, I don't have a problem with the media. But after working as an editor and journalist for places like CBS College Sports and WonderHowTo.com, I've seen the guts of how our world works, and sometimes we can be lazy. If it's easier and faster to put out a story saying Amazon is murdering retail, or that comic book stores are dying because everyone wants to shop online for everything, we'll do it. In almost every case, we're underpaid, overworked, have zero job security, and work for people obsessed only with metrics and not the truth. Let me put all this another way. While totally stipulating that Amazon is making billions, shit, you can buy my comic Vengeance Nevada exclusively through their Comixology app, so even I'm part of their machine. Why do you think Borders went out of business? Was it because of Amazon, or because of gross mismanagement and overexpansion? The same kind of overexpansion that's harming a lot of stores in the retail sector today. Hint, it wasn't Amazon. I can, and probably will, write a book about this. But my point here is that the tech companies want you to believe that online shopping is the wave of the future, even though most people, if given the preference, still prefer to purchase things at a brick-and-mortar store. The big deal-breaker for most people is price. If they can get it for less online, they'll get it online. But again, there's money in magic. And if we all say and think that Amazon is magic, then we're less likely to peek under the hood and see what they're really up to. I'm not in the prediction business, 
But I am willing to go out on a limb and say that this lifestyle of people buying things exclusively online won't ever be the dominant mode of retail and commerce. For one, it's been over 20 years since the media and tech companies started saying that, and it hasn't happened yet. For another, people are social creatures. We like to go outside. We like to do things. We like interacting with other people. This is how we're wired. Given that fact, it's hardly surprising that most consumers prefer to shop in a brick-and-mortar store over shopping online. Most people prefer the experience of going out, looking at the products, touching them, and comparing them to the other items around them. And frankly, also according to Pew, most of us just don't trust online reviews. We trust our friends and family. There are many reasons for our brick-and-mortar preferences, including the above-mentioned social and tactile elements. But since this is a book on privacy, let me give you another reason that's relevant for our purposes. A lot of people are concerned about their data being properly protected, and they don't trust the online retailers, or the devices they use to visit those retailers, to provide that protection. So in their mind, not only do you get a better shopping experience offline, but you're less likely to get creeped on as well. I wish that were true. I'm a Facebook hipster. I then deleted my Facebook account and then re-upped it in 2005 and have not been able to get off the stupid thing since. So so why can't you get off? So wh <laughs> what are your... <laughs> you guys... <laughs> The award-winning Smashing Security Podcast, hosted by Graham Cluley and Carol Terrio each week, it takes an irreverent look at cybersecurity and online privacy, helping you find out what's happening with your data. Find it in Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and all good podcast apps, or at smashingsecurity.com. It's not all filth. Here's the funny thing. The brick-and-mortar stores, in some cases, are getting just as invasive as their online counterparts in terms of collecting data about you and violating your privacy. And a lot of the reason they're doing that is so they can better compete with Amazon. This is a lot like trying to fight a pyromaniac with a flamethrower. What we're talking about here in this chapter is how brick-and-mortar stores are increasingly using your smartphone to pinpoint your exact location within the store. There are other technologies currently in play, but at the time of this writing, it's not clear if any of them, like beacons, will actually pan out. Having worked with the beacons firsthand, I can tell you there are a whole bunch of problems involving them. Plus, all these technologies rely on your smartphone. So, we'll focus on that specific method of customer tracking here. Also, nobody is walking around the mall with a head-mounted display just yet. I mean, as far as I know, anyway. It sure makes you wish for the good old days, right? My grandfather had a store in Brooklyn back in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Back then, he came into his store if you were looking for men's clothing. It was called the Empire Men's Shop. You bought what you wanted, and then you went home. Maybe, if my grandfather had to order something, he'd take your number and call you when the item came in. That was the entire relationship between him and the customer. And you know what the funny thing is? There were plenty of other places, probably less expensive for customers to visit. But they went to see my grandfather because they formed a relationship with him. They were loyal customers, the kind that can keep a company in business for half a century. That's something that shouldn't be lost in this larger discussion of why companies want to gather so much data about you. A lot of it is done in the name of building brand and customer loyalty. The brands think all this data will help them form the same kind of relationship, digitally and offline, that my grandfather had with his customers. They're wrong in most cases, as we talked about earlier. Nothing beats human-to-human -human interaction, and that's the glue that holds everything in our world together. All the data in the world can't replace that. Remember, data is great, but it's not the solution to your problems. It's only part of the solution. If you work in marketing and advertising, data is great at the top of the sales funnel, but it should not be your first and only point of reference with your customers. 
I'm willing to bet that's still the case in a lot of small businesses across the world. Good customer relations translates to lifelong customers. To these businesses, the data is mostly meaningless beyond what's selling, what customers want, and what customers need. But if you're a bigger company, even though your customers may not be pleased about being tracked, tech companies are pushing their technology onto you, as are your corporate managers and shareholders. I've sat in on more than one meeting involving a multi-billion dollar property that actively boasted about their use of iBeacon technology to track customers all over the store, thereby acquiring better and more accurate data than what could be scooped up on those customers through just tracking them using Wi-Fi. Why? Who cares? Serve your customers by talking to them the way humans are supposed to. We don't want or need you to be Amazon. We already have one of those. But now I'm getting off track. As you can tell, I'm pretty passionate about offline shopping because I know how important it is to the fabric of our society. Remember, this whole human experience kicked off with hunting and gathering. The fact that we dress all fancy and go to the store to do our hunting and gathering doesn't make us any different than our ancestors. In-store tracking In-store cameras and other devices like beacons aside, your smartphone is one of the best tracking devices ever made. Did you ever watch a TV show where one of the characters who has a smartphone gets planted with a tracking device? It's a common TV trope, but here's another funny thing. The tracking device is unnecessary. That's because if your phone is set to connect to Wi-Fi, it's constantly broadcasting itself to Wi-Fi networks around you, looking to connect to them. And since your phone has its own unique number, every time you go into the store, that same number appears meaning it's easy to build up a pattern of shopping behavior showing what you do while you're in the store. And to be clear here, we're talking about you. Yes, you. The person reading this. Your name is Jackie Bince, and your favorite book is The Sirens of Titan by Kurt Vonnegut. Okay, maybe not. But that unique number from your phone? Don't let anyone tell you the data is anonymized and we don't know where you live after visiting the store. We totally do. There are more than a few apps in the retail world that are constantly tracking your location, even when you're not in their store. So between having your specific mobile phone number and the app activated and broadcasting your data, a store can pretty much tell when you're using the bathroom, if they really wanted to get creepy. I wasn't kidding about the being followed into the bathroom thing, you know. And yes, I wish I was kidding. But having worked on an app like this, I can reliably tell you that I'm not. Put another way, did you ever wonder how Google Maps knows how heavy the traffic is on your intended route? Yeah, they're not using satellites to figure that out. They're using your phone and everyone else's phone around you that has that app installed. For now, collecting your shopping patterns isn't terribly useful to the retailer in terms of targeting you specifically. They can make heat maps of the store and rearrange their inventory to spots you and other customers frequent, but that's about it. However, as technology improves, you can bet on the store taking the next step. As just one example, the store could send you a push notification alerting you to a sale on the exact item you're currently looking at. Now, is this a bad thing? Getting a coupon for the item you're looking at while you're in the store? I don't think it is. As it relates to dealings with tech companies, if we give them a piece of our data and privacy, they will give us a free service that's pretty good at what it does. We seem okay with that. But we're creeped out when tech companies are aggressive, unclear, or deceitful about what they're collecting and how, and who they're sharing it with. And that's where the problem rests here as well. Since when was it a good idea for brick-and-mortar stores to be doing the same thing as Amazon? Not every dev team is going to deactivate a feature for being too creepy in their location-tracking retail app. So, although a lot of privacy advocates will tell you a discussion needs to take place, I don't agree. I think a store should tell you, in clear terms on their website and in their app, what they're doing and how to opt out if you don't like it. One thing I want to stress in this book, the responsibility and consequences of collecting your data is on the company, not you. If anything, if a brick-and-mortar store wants your data so badly, they should pay you for it just like everyone else should.
Most things people hate about the internet comes from a lack of privacy, like those creepy ads that make you think your phone is listening to you. DuckDuckGo is an all-in-one privacy app that can help you with that. It's your internet browser with private search, tracking blocker, encryption, and even built-in email protection, all for free. Just go to DuckDuckGo.com to learn more. DuckDuckGo, privacy simplified. Thank you for listening to Stupid Sexy Privacy, a Weiwo.tv special report. Do you need a privacy audit? To help find new episodes of Weiwo.tv, BJ is offering one-on-one privacy audits. These are private, one-time consultations that are conducted securely through Signal. During the audit, BJ will walk you through all 23 steps from our special report to help you better protect your privacy. Now, just to be clear, we're going to share all 23 steps with you here, for free, in this podcast miniseries. Because these are all tactics you can use right now to help protect yourself from fascists and weirdos, and we want to help keep everyone safe. These privacy audits are meant for people who may need some extra help implementing these steps or have additional questions that they want answered. You can have your one-on-one privacy audit with BJ by sending an email to bjmendelson at duck.com. That email again is bjmendelson at duck.com. And we'll see you next time right here on weiwo.tv, right? Right?